Great. Oops. <laughs> uh oh. From beginning. There we go. Um, welcome everyone uh, to our Tribal Advisory Committee meeting. This is our regular meeting, the preceding meeting after our first um, kickoff. I am Valeria Atanasio, Tribal Affairs Manager with ELD and a citizen of Grand Ronde. It's really good to be here with you all today. And first we'll start by um, having a welcome and uh, roll call on this meeting. Here, I will ask for um, Val, if you would want to just give us a, an opening welcome in whatever way you would like to, and um, then I will pull up the roll call sheet. Sure. Uh, Good afternoon, my relatives. Uh, I'm glad that you are all here. Um, if we could, I would just want to say a few words just to bless the people that are taking part in the meeting and the words and and that will come forth. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together. Lord, I ask that you give me. So we're going to quickly go over our roll call for today. Val, if you would like to um, help us read these names, and I'll get I'll track who's here, who's present, and who's absent. Okay. So, uh, Patrick Flanagan. Angela Blackwell. Sorry, I'm here. This is Patrick. Hi, Patrick. <laughs> Angie, are you here? Yet. She's joining a little late, I think, from an appointment. Okay, and Valeria? Present. Allie? Um, we have Angela Fasana on in place of Allie, who's on maternity leave. Oh, okay. And then we have another Allie, Norman? I'm here. Thank you. Alyssa Severson? Here. Alyssa, Alyssa Lane King. Not here. Okay. okay. Danny Kachaya. Danny's not here today. Uh, Dini Smith. Leanne Brown. Diane Tiemann. Jennifer Jackson. Present. Josh Davies. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm here. Hey, Josh. Julie Systream. I'm here, too. Welcome, Christina Simpson. Christina had to call out for um, child, sick child. Lloyd Commander. Present. Lloyd. Michael Cherry. Yeah. Yeah. Modesta Minturn. Sandy Henry. Sandy is not able to join today. Vanessa Bahi. Here. Okay. Thank you, Val. Here, do we have quorum? Yes. All right. Even with those absence. I'm going to 
reshare my screen now for our PowerPoint. We'll continue on. Okay, so this is just a quick look at our agenda for today. I wanna go over, we already did our TAC welcome and roll call. We're gonna be reviewing some group agreements that we um, made at our last meeting in October. Then we're gonna have our um, TAC facilitator help us walk through the four agreements by Don Miguel Luis. There is no public testimony information. This will remain a standing agenda item for these meetings um, in, in case we do receive any public testimony. Then we'll go into a tribal sovereignty group breakout session where we'll discuss um, what tribal sovereignty means for us um, as individuals and how we would like to bring tribal sovereignty into this space. We'll go into a group discussion and small breakout session um, with each of our TAC members to discuss this committee composition and some of the um, the questions and uh, wonderings that came up at our last meeting. And then we'll transition to uh, a rulemaking advisory committee update from Remy Watts. We'll take a small five minute uh, screen break between um, these two items on our agenda. And then when we come back from that five minute break, we'll review um, the, uh, We'll, we'll review the TAC charter, um, we'll look at the chair and vice chair appointments, and then we'll discuss um, tribal advisory committee meeting minutes. And then at that point, we will be closing and adjourning this meeting for today. Are there any questions at this point? I did want you to know that Modesta is here, that she's having trouble with her mic. Thank you, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get going. Feel free to, to um, please use the chat. You can um, access the chat at the bottom of your screen um, by clicking the chat box and it should open up a window where you can type in um, any answers or contributions that you'd like to make during the meeting. Just a reminder um, that our upcoming meeting for December is scheduled for December 13th, 3 p.m to 5 p.m. Sorry about the whiplash for Zoom, guys, <laughs> but these are small documents. <laughs> okay, and then I will um, kick it off to Lorraine to help us um, get started. All right, well, welcome everyone. And um, we wanted to also uh, honor that this is Native American Heritage Month. And um, so we thought maybe you could put in the chat something, um, what does it mean to you? Maybe one word. So, uh, and maybe Val, uh, Valeria, you can give us kind of an idea by sharing what it means to you. And you're on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I'd be happy to share. Um, so this is a, obviously, I think, a really special time um, for us to celebrate our indigeneity and uh, to celebrate in community with our um, tribal community, our allies, and people that um, support the rights of Native Americans and our existence here since time immemorial. I recently got an opportunity, um, which I haven't in a long time, to go sing um, with um, some of my canoe family members um, here in Salem. And that's something that I remember doing growing up as a kid. Um, they would travel us around to go sing. <laughs> Um, or dance, um, or you know, do some cultural sharing, especially during this time where people um, 
want to learn and, and the awareness around learning about accurate history and more accurate narratives um, are, are happening everywhere. And so I got to do that and I actually took my two little ones and um, it was a special moment for me because um, it was the first time my daughter's, my three-year-old actually um, was able to hold a rattle and keep in a uh, beat with the drum. And so it's a really proud moment for me as a parent. All right, so if you could put one word in the chat, what it means to you, it might take more than one, but close to one word. And, uh, and then uh, I'll read them off. You don't, uh, it's a little faster to do it that way um, than to have each person unmute and share. So if you didn't mind, and uh, for me, I think it's encouraging. Um, we should have it every month, but I'm glad we have this one month because it does leave the opportunity uh, for teachers and uh, different places to acknowledge our contributions. All right, so I'm gonna read in the chat. It to work. So I have uh, respect, prayers up to seven generations back and hope for seven generations forward. Respect, hope, pride, uh, language, pride again, and honoring. So if anyone else would like to share in the chat. We'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you. All right. Uh, we help each other. We will live good. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't. I. I don't know how to read your language. Did you want to unmute and say it in your language? Uh, it's, it says not see what did you are. Beautiful. And uh, we really are in a time, um, certainly when, you know, my parents and my grandparents uh, had to speak their language in secret. And now we can proudly um, say our words and use our voice. So this is a, a good transition for me. We have, uh, it means culture, traditions, memories, and family. Thank you everyone for sharing. All right, thank you. All right, so um, Last time, everyone was very helpful, and um, I really appreciated the participation and talking about what your group agreements, this is what we will be um, sharing with each other and supporting each other. And we can always add things, or you might have thought of something you might want to add after um, some of us are reflective thinkers, and we like to come back uh, around to you know, fully give it the thought and time it deserves. Um, so one of the things we said, it was important to step up and, and also step back, right? So step up and use your voice, but also know that uh, often uh, it's the same people who share. And so part of having um, a good group, a, a working team, is uh, to support others who might be uh, more are on the quiet side, but have lots to say. And so to be able to step back um, and support those. 
and uh, to listen to all points of view. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about the team is no one has exactly all the same view, the same background, the same information. And what makes a good team is that we come together and we share those different perspectives and it helps us uh, grow and expand our knowledge. Uh, to understand that everyone comes from all walks of life and, you know, we share it as each, you know, uh, tribal government is not exactly the same. And so, and our experiences are not all the same. So that's something that uh, will uh, be patient and uh, with each other and respectful, uh, that we value everyone's voice, that everyone uh, has an opportunity to share. We spend a lot of time, uh, the acknowledgement as uh, as respect. Um, we talked a lot about respect and how important that is if we're going to be a really healthy team that is family centered and has this wonderful opportunity um, to have an impact on the development of this early uh, learning uh, program. So uh, respect looks like, we talked about what does respect look like? And uh, I like someone said, uh, respect looks like children at play sharing with one another. So being able to do that, there's a, there's a book, like everything I needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten because there are things like share, don't hit each other. <laughs> <laughs> talk nice, you know, but they work for as adults as they do when you're five years old. So uh, we'll, we will seek common ground. So that's something um, that takes work. It doesn't just happen and it comes with trust. And so we want to make that um, kind of the ground uh, part of what we're doing, the basis in um, how we work together, right? Uh, remain positive uh, when met with negativity. Um, there's always, I, I always appreciated in native ways of raising um, children in the past, we didn't say, what did you do that was wrong? What did you learn from what you did that was bad? We didn't say that. We said, what did you learn <laughs> from this uh, from this experience? So that's not good and it's not bad, but it's an opportunity to learn together. So uh, respectful to time, to come to meetings on time, stay the length when possible and be attentive. And we know that on Zoom, it's uh, often, um, you know, we still have, you know, our phones and other things are happening and uh, we might have dogs or children. And so we just do the best that we can. And what I find is uh, everyone's been very gracious with Zoom and it's better to be in person, but we've been really, it's kind of been a blessing to have Zoom so that we can uh, continue uh, doing this work. So that was the four agreements. Is there anything as you look at this you'd like to add? Anybody want to unmute? Is there something you thought about since the last time we met and you'd like to add it? All right, then you can always, uh, uh, if you think of something, you can email Valeria or Val, and uh, we'll make sure that that addition is added. Okay. All right, so the next slide, this is the four agreements. I, um, there's a book on, and it's a uh, very interesting and Don Miguel Ruiz was a medical doctor and he got into a serious car accident and was uh, hurt critically. And he, it took him a long time to recover. And then part of that recovery time, he decided to go back to his people. Um, and so while he was there, he thought that he would kind of research because he came from a long line of spiritual leaders uh, really wise people. And he uh, started talking to them about life and what was the important things about life and what do we need to know. And, and he and it came down to these four um, agreements that we make with ourselves. This is for ourselves and our uh, growth. 
whether in our life, with our family, the people we work with, our community. And, um, and one was uh, be impeccable with your word, uh, speak with integrity, say only what you mean, avoid using the word to speak against yourself or to gossip about others, use the power of your word in the direction of truth and love. So, um, so in applying this to our group, that it's important to say what you need to say here in our meeting, not afterwards. Um, I have a friend and she calls in Native communities, we have drive-by gossip, like we go by and we say, oh, who does that person think they are or whatever, and, um, and it can be really negative, and it is just as much a form of violence, uh, because gossip hurts uh, often even more, so that um, uh, there's a lot of work that's being done now in many Native communities, uh, what we call lateral violence. And that means when you're oppressed, you can't oppress back up, so you oppress each other. So we sometimes can be harder on each other than we are on anybody else. So we wanna avoid that. So the other uh, thing is to don't make assumptions. And that's a hard one sometimes, but find the courage to ask questions to, and to express what you really want. Uh, communicate with others as clearly as you can to avoid misunderstanding, sadness, and drama. Uh, with just this one agreement, you can completely transform your life. Um, we make a lot of assumptions, and um, but as you know, when we're in our groups, and sometimes it's not what you say, but it's how you say it or how you heard someone say it. And when we uh, agreed that we would step up. This is the time uh, to ask for clarification. Um, uh, did you mean to insult me? Did you mean, uh, I'm wondering because I felt uh, hurt when you said that. Uh, what, did you mean to do that? You know, to be able to ask uh, those questions. Uh, so thinking of it in that way. And don't take anything personally. That's a tough one because everything seems personal. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, as we're working with these different groups, with the government, with tribes, and really as we, we really want to um, work government to government, and we're really striving for consensus, and we're going to do the best that we possibly can. We're really, this is really our, our uh, effort and we'll do everything that we can to make that happen. So, but nothing that others do is because of you. Um, when things don't work out, it, not to take it personally, what others say or do um, is a projection of their own reality, their own dream. Uh, when you're immune to the opinions and actions of others, you won't be a victim of needless suffering because we can really beat ourselves up like, why did he say that? Or why did he do that? Or why did he, you know, and uh, it's not helpful, right? So, and the last one is always do your best. If, uh, your best is going to change from moment to moment. You're not who you were a year ago or 10 years ago. Um, we keep growing and um, it will be different when you are healthy as opposed to sick. Um, <laughs> under any circumstances, simply do your best and you'll avoid self-judgment, self-abuse and regret. As long as we do the best we can. And as uh, was said before, we all bring different gifts. And so just supporting each other. So as you look at those four agreements, we had our first meeting uh, last week, last week, last month. And as we're establishing our, our group, is there anything that anyone feels like they would like to ask or have a question or something they felt uncomfortable about uh, for the team? This would be um, a good time um, if there was something you wanted to share. Any concerns left over from, and we'd like to do this each time we meet, give you the opportunity if there's something that needs clarification and uh, some things we might be talking about yet um, on the agenda, but just to make sure if you have a, have a concern or a question. All right. So I have. I wanted to give you enough time. Um, 
or you might want to put something in the chat and we could get back to you later. Um, that would be fine too. All right, thank you. All right, uh, back to you, Valeria. Oh, um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, and I would just, just a quick check-in. If you're not um, speaking, if you wouldn't mind muting your mic, we are getting a little bit of feedback here um, just to check in. And then yes, Lorraine's gonna go over as a reminder, a consensus. Standard. Oh yes, <laughs> I almost forgot. I, yeah, we're gonna go over this just as a reminder from last week is that we're our goal is really consensus. We're, uh, we wanna to try to honor our traditional values. And in the past it meant meeting late, right? In the evening or early morning until a, a, a agreed decision, like people would just meet. They would just, no one would leave. But today that's not possible, right? We're, we're balancing getting to consensus within the current barriers of time constraints and commitments. We've got childcare, we have people have to make dinner, we have all kinds of things and commitments. So, um, so we will always try to end as close to it on uh, the allotted time as possible. Okay, so this next reminder is um, um, as we vote on things, if you agree, it's gonna be thumbs up um, so that we can, you'll have to unmute. Uh, if you can live with it, thumbs sideways. <laughs> um, and if you're uncomfortable, thumbs down. And then we'll be able to get a good idea if hopefully you can show your video so I can see you. And we'll always have this up. Um, I won't go over it, but uh, how the voting works and um, how we'll move to vote. And uh, um, so, we hope we have a couple of things to vote on today, so we could revisit this if we need to. All right, now um, on this part is uh, breaking up and we're gonna break it into small groups. And Valeria, did you wanna talk any more about what does tribal sovereignty mean to you? Yeah, I just put in the chat too that you can always um, say, or I should have wrote right thumbs up in the chat as well, or thumbs down or thumbs sideways. Um, whenever um, you were voting, um, Does mine look you don't good too. Mm -hmm. You don't have to unmute if you if you don't want to do that at the time. So I will um, stop sharing my screen for just a second, and then I will uh, talk about what we're going to do next, which is our breakouts. So we're going to go into a breakout session today um, together to um, talk about what tribal sovereignty means to each of us. Um, tribal sovereignty, as you know, is, is defined legally um, at the federal, state, and tribal level. Um, and it's really that, you know, tribes themselves have um, the ability to govern themselves and provide comprehensive services um, to their defined membership and, and community um, that could include education, healthcare, law enforcement, um, and any other types of services to respect to their respective citizens. So um, we realize, you know, that this conversation is extremely important to how our relationship will work as a gov to gov or a state to tribe relationship. And so we wanted to do a quick breakout with you all to sort of explore you know, through um, direct nation to nation, you know, relationships, um, how we can, you know, identify the interconnected interests that we have in serving our children and families in Oregon, and what kind of principles um, of tribal sovereignty or pillars of tribal sovereignty do we want to bring into this space with us as we do our work together. So um, I'm going to put two uh, to chat, uh, excuse me, two questions for us to explore in our small groups um, into the chat window now. And uh, then I will break us out into small groups and we'll come back together as a whole group then to discuss um, how that went or what came up for us either by unmuting or participating in the chat. And so the purpose of this is um, really to um, 
hope I added both, sorry. <laughs> Let me add number one question, number two. So the purpose of this is um, really to get us talking about um, how we want to integrate um, a check-in around tribal sovereignty or gov to gov within these standing meetings. So the outcome of this will be that we'll share you know, our thoughts in our small groups. And then when we come back as a whole group, we can share one to three words each that would signify um, us checking in about tribal sovereignty within um, in a, a standing agenda item. And then we'll take all those um, sort of comments and uh, contributions and we'll actually put a name on the standing agenda item um, that we, you know, as a TSC came up with today together. So that's gonna be our next step for this. Give me a second and I'll get us broken down into small groups. And I'm gonna pause our recording prior to breaking out in small groups and then resume recording when we come back. Okay, so we know that was a short <laughs> um, breakout room for you all, but I am hoping um, that you had a chance to um, engage a little bit with our questions around what, what does tribal sovereignty mean to you and how you would like to bring that into this space that we're sharing um, with the ELD and our uh, appointed tribal advisory committee members. So if anyone would like to share or feels like they can be somewhat of a little bit of a spokesperson for the group that they were in, please um, step up and, and share with us um, potentially one to three words or just general um, thoughts um, that were contributed around uh, what tribal sovereignty means to you and how we wanna respect that in this space that we share. Angela Um, Valerie or Patrick, did you want to go or would you like me to try to summarize a little? Go ahead, Angela. Uh, uh, Val, uh, Larry, I will tell you that two of the three or four people that were in our room were are either are or were attorneys. So asking us to do anything in one to three <laughs> words is just not functionally <laughs> possible. Uh, but <laughs> give Angela a shot at it. <laughs> okay, I think that um, we had, I don't know if we can do one or two, three words, so like Patrick said, but I think um, one of the concerns or one of the thought process is that making sure that we are always checking in with tribal nations. Um, at times when things are happening, tribal nations' voices are heard on the same level as maybe other groups and organizations. Uh, around the state and really if we want to respect sovereignty we need to, to have a little bit of a deference given to the tribal nations voices or um and some talk to them first and and then also seeking of course all kinds of information but when we put them all on a level playing field we're not really respecting the sovereignty of the nations um, and we do need to be giving some deference to those how did I do, Patrick, Mallory? Did I capture it? <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> Larry, I can go for our group. Thank you. So we just talked about um, the need for um, education around the uniqueness of all of the nine federally recognized tribes and continual um, education about self-determination and self-governance and and the need for um, collaboration on on many on many levels. And the one word that we had at the end to tie that in was unity. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, both Angie and Michael. Anybody else want to share some thoughts or takeaways, or one word, two words? Um. I could share for our group, Josh, Jennifer, and Lloyd talked about uh, being unique nations, a voice to be heard, uh, being able to choose and make our own rules. 
and the collective will of our own people. That's narrowing it down. We said a lot more, but that narrows it down. Thank you. And I'm sorry, when she said the word unique, that did remind me that somebody in our group had unique as well. Okay. Unique. Great. Hello, I can speak for um, Alyssa and myself. Uh, first thing we found out is that she's Coquil and I'm Coos. So we're kind of neighbors and cousins and all that. So that was something that we, we spoke about. And uh, and uh, the, the passing of our elders this year has been a hard year for, for, uh, for all of us, but with, with our tribe specifically. She just lost her dad and, and, it, and, their chief, and they lost their chief earlier this summer. And, and I lost my mom in, uh, in February. So we spoke about that. Uh, we spoke about um, using uh, cultural historical ways of learning to teach. We spoke about having the, uh, the space and ability to choose uh, what we are, uh, the ways that we're uh, serving our, our uh, students, our culture, and our people. And if we were choosing specific words, we choose out culture, history, rights, and our people. Thank you for sharing that, Jolie. Um, and our heart is with everyone who's grieving someone right now. And and in the communities um, currently experiencing loss. Are there any other contributions that folks want to um, make in relation to this? I think we had one other group um, potentially that was um, engaging in this conversation of how we'd like to bring tribal sovereignty into our space and make sure that it's respected. Feel free um, to also contribute any thoughts that you have um, at any time throughout this meeting today, um, even if it comes to you later within a meeting item or the way that we're approaching the situation that brings to you, um, you know, the thought of tribal sovereignty and how we will want to uh, move forward. Please feel free to share that throughout this meeting and in the chat at any point. Okay, I'll go back to the um, sharing the screen for you all. Okay. And we'll move on to our next item that is really relevant, I think, to the conversation that we just started around rights, um, making sure that, you know, we put in the intentional time and space that it takes for things to be taken back to tribal governments and discussed at the levels of tribal councils um, so that decisions can be made within this group and also um, all the work and programs that come out of building a tribal hub in Oregon um, and that the, the tribal governments themselves are um, endorsing and, and supporting, you know, the the approach and way that we're moving. So this came up at our last meeting um, and um, I'll just do a quick summary overview for each of you to make sure that we're all starting at the same, uh, starting at the same uh, or on the same page, excuse me, in terms of understanding um, where we're at with this. But I'd like to talk about the Tribal Advisory Committee composition. So who is part of the Tribal Advisory Committee and who was invited to be part of this group? Um, so last at our last check-in, or excuse me, our kickoff meeting, we learned um, really that um, tribes, you know, brought forth a really valid concern about the inclusion of um, in particular, the four family representatives as voting members to this committee. We heard the concern that because these family representative um, 
were not selected by tribal governments themselves, it would be, you know, unethical for these um, these reps to have like a voting place on the interests of a tribal government. And we completely um, agree with that and hear it and want to know how we would like to respond um, with your direction and your guidance as tribal advisory committee members. So, where we're at with it is really, um, as you recall, prior to establishing this committee and going through some of the legislative concept pieces and presenting that, um, the ELD sought to um, cons consult with each of the nine tribes via the gov to gov education cluster in hopes to garner tribes participation in recruiting and attaining members that would fulfill these four family represented seats. That um, was sort of our intention and in theory, however, in practice, this did not transfer very well because we then came to that sort of, um, I think just question around if these members, you know, have voting rights, how does that affect a tribe or how will it um, represent a tribe? And so Currently, we know that there's one family representative to the TAC and three vacant positions to date. Um, that family representative isn't on the call today. She just couldn't join us today. Um, but this is really an open discussion for us to start thinking about how we might continue um, and work around um, this issue as it's come up. So included in our house bill specifically, um, we were looking at the language within the enrolled bill and it states that four parents of children enrolled in early childhood care and early childhood education programs as identified by representatives of the nine federally recognized Indian tribes of this state. So it, it says within our bill itself basically that um, tribes um, of this state would help us, again, garner the participation of these four family representatives. And then those, those four family representatives would be added to the TAC too, with the intention to um, give, you know, that family voice, center that family voice and that child's voice within the work that we do and in the programs and services that we hope to develop throughout this process. Um, making sure that they're, you know, things that we develop are family friendly in the language, in the application and in the implementation guidance that we build. And so our problem really is, is like, how will we move forward? How will we um, sort of work through this understanding that, um, that this current arrangement with having the four family representatives as part of the TAC may not fall in line with our government to government partnership and uphold that government to government relationship that we know we we value and we want to keep as part of this committee work. So we have come up with um, some possible solutions for you all to sort of think about and consider. And so we'll talk about this. Um, I'll go over these, these um, possible solutions with you today. Um, and then we'll go into really a small breakout and it'll be with um, your, your uh, tribal counterpart. So whoever you are representing. So if you're from um, Grand Ronde, um, you'd be paired with your Grand Ronde other representative. If you're from uh, Umatilla or Coquil, you'd be paired with those representatives to just discuss um, these three possible solutions and what you think about them thus far. Um, so some of the possible solutions that we'd like to propose for you for discussion today are one, um, at the request of you all as the Tribal Advisory Committee, the ELD can seek to create a subcommittee of nine parent voices. And so what this would essentially do is um, we would um, propose technical fixes to House Bill 2055 during the upcoming legislative sort, short session. We would, um, we would basically create a subcommittee of nine parent voices um, that would be called something along the lines of like a tribal parent committee. 
This would allow us to garner um, participation from each of the nine tribes versus only having the four family representatives as it currently is structured. So we'd be able to actually get parent participation from each of the nine tribes so that there's equitable, dis equitable distribution of um, voice and representation um, being brought into this work. And, um, and then also um, this tribal parent committee would basically hold an endorsement vote. And so how that's different from, I think, what we think of when we talk about a tribal interest vote, which is what you guys all represent um, as TAC members, we would, um, the parent, how it would work is that the, the tribal advisory committee, whoever the tribal representatives are, mm -hmm. as they take information or um, uh, documents and things back to their tribes, and then they decide how they would like to move forward and they say yes or no on something, then um, things will then go to this tribal parent committee um, to just ensure that there's um, sort of this, like I said, the, the language is family friendly, that um, through application that this is, it falls in line with how parents are currently accessing services or potentially reducing the barriers that may exist with parents accessing services. Um, and they would hold an endorsement vote to say, yes, we agree with our tribe's decision or just no, we, we don't agree with our tribe's decision. And that would only be to, um, it wouldn't hinder, you know, what happens within the TAC or the government to government process. It would just be more of um, them acknowledging um, how the tribes are moving forward and being part of um, the work um, in the in the intentional way that we, I think, wanted, which is that we're centering again those children and families' experiences and those unique perspectives in what we're building. Let me pause there because that was kind of a mouthful too. So I want to know um, first off. I need to answer any questions around clarity or how um, how I just um, stated option number one as a solution. Does anyone have any questions right off the bat or wonderings in the chat? Okay, I don't see anything coming in, but feel free to unmute if you'd like. Julie said, sounds good for all nine tribes, equity, yes. I have a question for you, if I may. Yeah. Uh, given that you have one family representative now and the other three are vacant, is that due to the fact that you are having difficulty finding the other three individuals? And, and my question would be, if you want to increase it from four to nine, is that a realistic expectation? Or if we're already having difficulty finding four, is it going to be any easier to find nine? Thank you for asking that. Um, well, I think for for since our first kickoff meeting, what we've sort of acted on is just sort of pausing on the recruitment strategy to, to get those other three vacant positions filled. So we haven't um, sought to, to get those positions filled. And so I don't know that it would be an issue. Um, that would really be also a question for our tribes today. And, you know, if we did you know, create this subcommittee of nine parent voices, you know, how how realistic would that be for, for each of the tribes to put one family um, or tribal family person forward for that? Um, because I agree that it's sort of, um, it, it can look ambitious and um, especially if we only have one currently that was um, appointed thus far. So that that's really, I guess, what we're seeking sort of your also your um, input on uh, tribes here today is if if you if you can find, you know, one 
maybe family or parent voice that you would want to invite into this um, this uh, sort of subcommittee of tribal parents? And just as a follow up, as people are thinking about that, part of the reason that I ask is because looking at uh, HB 2055 and looking at the composition of the committee, I do see that there are some members, uh, for example, um, under sub D and some e, sub E that are non voting members. So if you're looking at a legislative fix, would it be preferable or just as easy to designate those four parents of children enrolled as also non-voting members? And would that solve the, the potential conflict that was identified in the last meeting? So I will be quiet now. That's a, that's a great consideration. Um, that actually relates to solution number two, sort of. Um, so we would basically, with solution number two, we'd keep the structure as it is, the composition of the committee, um, but make a technical fix still around voting or ex officio non-voting for those family representatives. Um, that's, a, that's a possible solution that we could look at if people are feeling like that's a good option as well. Um, it says here that we sort of change from a vote to an endorsement. Um, but we could also go the route that Patrick's mentioning right now, which is that they would just move into an ex officio status, which is non-voting. And then I'll move on then to the third option to just to um, get a little more sort of discussion going as well, or as people are thinking about this. Um, our third option is, um, similar to two, but, but we would continue with the current structure. And then we would propose that each of the nine tribes submit a family representative applicant in which you all as the tribal advisory committee could vote on to accept or not accept an applicant. And in this way, we would, um, we would talk with our current family appointed representative and we would ask um, her to go through um, official channels um, and connect with the tribe itself. And, and just um, if folks aren't aware, that member is um, also from uh, Warm Springs. So um, we would ask her to go through official channels to ask if she could be the family representative um, for this TAC. And if that wasn't an option, we'd have to then look at um, officially making some kind of um, decision in um, in how we'd, how we'd approach that and how we'd uh, get somebody um, else, for example. So these are just some of some of our thoughts and initial sort of um, solutions to the issue that came up. and I, I really just want to say that um, why we're talking about this now is super crucial of how successful and we're going to be in moving forward because we do want to respond to those concerns that were brought up at our last meeting and we want to find, you know, a collaborative solution um, in that feels good to tribes and that feels like we're not trying to, um, you know, circumvent, you know, official government to government processes. We really, um, so I just want to state that because I think that, uh, yeah, the intention, um, again, was to do something. And then that that might have been in theory, but in practice, it didn't really transfer well. So I want to just um, reiterate that we're open to really any possible solutions as well for that the TAC um, would consider or bring up. Um, in how to move forward around um, these these four family representatives. Does anyone have um, a preference? I'm happy to start a breakout where you could be in a room directly with um, 
your tribal sort of partner, if you don't have a partner today, can add you to another room if that's helpful or pair you up to discuss first um, together and then come back and, and do the whole group or we can or we can talk about it as a whole group, whatever is most comfortable for folks. Does anyone have any preference on that? Um, this is Jennifer. On number three, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you say that the members of the Tribal Advisory Committee votes on whether or not to accept an applicant? That would be the, that would be the suggested route, yes. Yeah, I don't feel comfortable <laughs> telling another tribe that whoever they're, that they're putting sure. up can't represent their tribe. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you for, for saying that. And these aren't perfect, right? I mean, maybe we need to not say that the TAC votes to accept. I mean, right, um, we're still sort of thinking through how we may approach. And um, some of the things that I have heard um, around like solution number one is that this would allow us to sort of change the composition in a way that respects that government to government while still engaging parent voice in this process and and also growing that parent voice from you know when we were limited to having four within house bill 2055 we would actually be able to have um you know nine and that would be um equitable representation of each of the tribes so um that's just my thoughts on it, and I'm not a decision, you know, here you all hold official sort of votes. And so I, I, I do want to hear sort of um, what people feel about that one as well, option number one. And, and is, does that seem like a realistic solution? Is it okay to ask a question? Yes, please ask. Uh, with number one, uh, speaking about the concern that uh, Patrick voiced, if we only had one uh, out of the four that, that you know, so far for the, the first round of requests for this parent engagement, and he's concerned that we wouldn't be able to get nine, you know, one from each uh, tribe. Is it something that could be flexible in the, in the makeup so that, you know, potentially we, it would be nice for us to have one represented from each tribe? Um, but they may not be able to come up with it all at, all at the same time, but they can be added as soon as, as that person is brought forward or, or we have to have it like from beginning and, and that's it. Thank you for asking that. We, um, as far as I know, we're not constrained by any sort of timelines. If we do take this route, the only timeline that I can share would be sort of on, on my mind at the top is that we will have to put together um, very broad language as it relates to creating the subcommittee and making those technical fixes to the House bill itself by January. However, mm. that's not our stopping place. We're able to make amendments and changes to that language within the bill from January through June. So we still have many months ahead of us to keep talking about this and then um, allow for also adequate time for you all to take information back to uh, tribal governments maybe to seek their input as well about how how they'd like to see us move forward. But in terms of once it um, through short short session once that passes, I think we can sort of define um, the parameters around you know making sure that we'll get the full participation of nine parent voices and understand that it won't happen all at once. Valeria, this is Valerie. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, you know, one of the things that um, uh, is a message that I keep hearing is that we're going to center on family be you know because we'll have these parent voices um i'm uh so tell me if i'm wrong or not here but are we assuming that the um, eight of the 18 representatives we don't have four parents that are not you know that wouldn't bring that voice to the table um, 
Just for clarity, so you're saying that if, um, are we assuming um, that we don't have four parents able to come to the table? I'm, I guess I'm having a hard time understand the question. Uh, that of the 18 that we okay. have. Okay, of the 18. That, yes. that we don't have parent voice. I'm, you know, I'm oh, thinking. Okay, that, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that, you know, there's some younger people on here, uh, younger than me, uh, that would be able to uh, carry that um, voice to the table. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, um, no. And on a, I mean, short answer is no, for for sure not assuming that parent voice isn't part of already the tribal processes and things. Really, I think the intention is, is that we, um, with, with the current structure of regional hubs, a big component of that is parent voice. And I think in our conversations and engagement with tribes, we heard the need for flexibility also with um, provision of parenting education and things like that that aren't really existing at the at the regional level in the way that um, we'd like them to. And I'll just give you like an example. Um, other hubs have like parenting hubs, right? Parenting. Uh, education resources that are allocated um, to a regional hub where they can then the hub can take those dollars and invest them into the parents um, and do training leadership empowerment things like that things that we know tribes are actually doing already and I think for us we were thinking about um, that being a component of this work moving forward and that it would actually allow us to garner more resources potentially and more funding um, into this work or body of work um, that tribes then could utilize to do, do what they are currently doing and build upon the capacity of which um, tribes engage with their parents and, and create parent leaders and you know help parents get the training and education that they that they um, that they need and want um, to raise their children. So it, I don't want to assume anything here, and I don't think um, nobody, you know, at least from my standpoint, it's not an assumption. It's just really that this was part of how we um, structured it and how we wanted to bring that into the programming. So any additional thoughts about this right now or things that are coming up for you in regards to how we might move forward? Hello? Hi, Modesta. Hi. Um, I have a, a couple of concerns. And, um, one is I, I don't know if I consider this advisory committee is a government to government meeting, um, and which kind of, you know, makes me hesitant on all three of these, um, these, um, uh, I guess, and, uh, solutions, possible solutions that we have here. Um, because I think we have established a, an education government to government cluster, and this um, seems like it falls under that, but I don't think that an advisory committee me meeting kind of qualifies as a government to government meeting um, yeah. in this respect. So I'm, I'm hesitant to really um, to, to vote on any of this right now. Um, it, it, it just provides a lot of issues um, uh, with, you know, we're talking about tribal sovereignty and representation um, that we have to answer to as government representatives of our tribe. 
and it would, it would be kind of difficult to, uh, you know, to um, explain this, um, knowing that there are, would be four or nine, you know, non-tribal voices um, being added to the mix in what you're considering as a government government relationship. I just, I think we need to, to kind of work out that, that definition a little bit better, or, you know, I guess that understanding between the nine tribes and this advisory committee and the a newly formed early learning department, or is it division? Division, um, yeah. So that we can work out a, a better communication when it comes to um, government to government, because it's not as easy as this is an advisory committee. You know, let's have all nine tribes vote. Sure. Um, I think it's a it's a kind of a, a little bit of a bigger issue than that, and um, I, I just you know um, it, it's more complicated. And I, I'm drawing on experience that we had with the American Indian Alaska Native Advisory Committee. Um, we had, I think it was a year long discussion about who was going to participate on that committee. And again, it was all related to uh, the, um, the wording that was in the bill. And so um, it, was, it was a pretty lengthy um, discussion um, before um, and I don't even know if we really came to a resolution, but they did get their charter in and stuff like that. But it was a, it was a pretty big discussion on, on that. And so um, I just kind of wanted to point that out that, you know, and I think those of us that have participated in government to government um, meetings, this, this just doesn't quite meet that criteria. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I want to make sure that, you know, I at least voice that on behalf of the Yuma Tula tribe that this is, you know, um, uh, this is a different scenario that probably requires a different approach. That's all. Thank you for bringing that um, up, Modesta. And that actually brings me to what I wanted to share next, which is that really how we see this functioning in regards to the overall government to government meeting or, you know, sort of relationship is that we, while you as TAC members may vote on something within this committee, that is just the rec recommendation and advice that will be put forth to the education cluster. So we do plan to take this, um, this item specifically that we're talking about today to the December education gov to gov meeting um, to discuss more. Um, and and I know that that's something similar to the way that the AIAN um, advisory committee works through Office of Indian Ed as well as, you know, you guys sort of talk about things, discuss those things, make recommendations and advise, um, act in an advisory role. And then that then gets taken to the gov to gov education cluster. And that would be our intention with, with this work as well. And so I think, um, I think we have, you know, we're still developing like how that will be like, especially with the changes coming um, up around our agency. But I think the idea is that we would always take things to the to the cluster meetings um, for more of a formal sort of um, approval. And then while also allowing the time. So the reason we're bringing this up now and early with you all, especially um, as we're working through thinking about this is because we do have, you know, if we are going to do any um, actual items like regarding technical fixes to the bill itself or to creating a subcommittee, we have a placeholder bill ready for um, our house early childhood committee to consider. And um, for those timelines, that's why we're just sort of talking about it now, but we would hope to really get your advice here in this committee and a vote in terms of like, what would you recommend as the TAC? And then we'll take that to the, to the cluster. Um, and yeah, tell me if like, that's a good way to do it or um, if there's some other considerations that you think we should be making. But we, we do want to, um, I guess, spell that out a little more uh, clearly that this, this is an advisory um, committee. It's an advisory role. And any recommendations that come out of this committee will go to the government to government education cluster group.
Do you have any additional considerations or um, or thoughts about that? I guess from from what you just shared to Modesta around it doesn't feel like a government <laughs> and and you're right I think I think we need to sort of like iron out like that this really is an advisory committee and that we anything that comes out of this is really a recommendation and then that recommendation gets vetted with the gov to gov cluster um I think my my only kind of observation would be that um, on this advisory committee that um, the nine tribes not be outnumbered by non-tribal representation in the, if they're going to have a, a voting say. Can you repeat that last part? I'm sorry. What last part? Sorry. I heard you say, um, I want to make sure that someone isn't outnumbered, and I just didn't catch that last. I said, I, I think it would be, um, you know, if the nine tribes would not be outnumbered by non tribal representation if they're going to have a voting say. Okay, thank you for restating that. Any other additional comments? I think um, I think what we can do from this point is I have been taking notes and um, and we can share back out in an email um, a, a more like a formal follow up, but. Does it feel comfortable for folks to think about out of these three options, which one you might be leaning towards? Um, and then that recommendation then will be further discussed at gov to gov cluster. Sorry, my child. <laughs> Okay, so I'm looking for any um, any comments or questions or suggestions that you have, please keep putting them in the chat or feel free to email me directly. And I think we'll move to the next item if that feels okay with folks. And then if we need to, we Valeria, you just froze on us. Well, it looks like we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, Uh-oh. Oh, no, we lost Valeria. Well, y'all, I was up next. So let me just take over until we get Valeria back. How about that? Um, and let's see. Let me pull up my slides really fast. Uh-oh. Here we go. Okay. Um, anyway, um, we. this is good. Um, Lloyd C., we will take down your notes. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, hi, everyone. I am Remy Watts. I am a rule coordinator. Um, I've been here before. Hopefully you'll recognize me by, recognize me by now. Um, and let's see if I can, uh-oh, 
and someone else is the host right now. Um, I'm not positive who is the host. I think it's Alyssa Severson by chance. Would you mind um, giving me screen sharing abilities? I'm so sorry. I hope you're there. Okay, well, let's just, oh, Valeria, oh, Valeria's back. Um, excellent. Um, well, while Valeria is getting back on, I'll just talk you through what we were going to go through next. Um, so we just wanted to address um, some feedback that we heard at our first uh, meeting of the Tribal Advisory Committee around um, the required rulemaking that is part of the entire package. Oh, Valeria, you're back. <laughs> Thank you. And um, we wanted to let you know that we heard your concerns and we went back uh, to the drawing board and we realized that, um, well, when I say we, I mean me, I thought that <laughs> there was a hard legislative deadline that we were under and it turns out I was wrong. I was totally mistaken and it takes off all the pressure that um, are, is coming from our side in terms of the rulemaking. And we wanted to let you know that um, this is like, it, it's working out for all of us involved um, to extend the rulemaking advisory committee timeline. Um, so basically what we're thinking is that we're going to go through the rulemaking advisory subcommittee of the TAC on essentially the same timeline that we were on before, um, just giving uh, a wide breadth to the approval process of the final rule language. Um, so we're hoping to present it sometime in 2022. We're gonna go through with the RAC in early 2022, and um, there's plenty of buffer space to uh, push the rule language through all of the different tribal nation councils um, as appropriate. Um, and uh, there is one thing that I wanted to tell y'all just in case um, there, you know, you never know what these things, um, there may or may not be a possibility that we're going to need some rulemaking just to get people paid. Um, so that would be the one exception. Um, and if that was something that we had to do, uh, we would pass some temporary rule that would be underneath this like rural jurisdiction, but it would just to be to get like any tribal early learning hub employees paid. Once again, not sure if it's even going to be necessary, um, but that's the one thing that um, we would probably do is pass some temporary rule to um, get people the money that they deserve. Um, so anyway, um, just wanted to let you know that we heard your feedback and um, I feel good about like, I feel good about the timeline adjustment, especially because it's just super open now. And um, I was wondering if anyone had any comments or questions on that by chance. Cool. Well, if anyone does, um, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, my email is throwing it in the chat again. Remy.watts at ode.state.or.us, which we apparently are changing our emails here at the Early Learning Division um, on December 16th. But anyway, you'll see that in our emails. But anyway, um, cool. Well, that is the rulemaking update. That's really all I have to say. Um, and I will just pass it back to Valeria, um, unless anyone wants to unmute and um, ask me any questions in the meantime. But anyway, back to you, Valeria. <laughs> Thank you, Remy. Sorry about that interruption, guys. I think I had something go out my internet. Um, so this is just going to be in our um, in our uh, excuse me PowerPoint because it's just a good reminder of like how we will um, prepare draft rule language and then um, put that through the process so that you're still aware of like how how we'll go through in adopting rules for um, this body of work in the Tribal Early Learning Hub. And we'll just keep that in there as a reminder, nothing um, significant or new to share about it. Just wanted to put that in there for you all. And because of time, I don't know that we'll have um, an opportunity to do our break. And I really apologize for that. Um, but we'll just move on to the next item and maybe we could even um, end a little early for you all. I know it's been a long uh, Wednesday. <laughs> so Valeria and Val, I don't think we can cover four things in 20 minutes. So is, is there something you wanna prioritize or do you wanna just see how it goes? 
Yeah, so, um, yep. So we're gonna, um, the four things left for us to cover, can you um, remind me what those are? So um, voting on the charter, um, voting on the uh, chair, making nominations for the vice chair, uh, talking about the minutes and then our closing circle. Thank you. Yes, so we, um, and this is my error, but we're not gonna, uh, we don't have to vote on the charter today. Uh, we can push that to our December, if that's okay for folks. Um, I do wanna give more opportunity and ample time for you all to review the charter and ask questions about it, give comments, submit any feedback that you have as things are written in that. Um, I'll send it out again um, at the end of this meeting, and it is available on the Tribal Advisory Committee webpage, in which I'll link in the chat right now. Um, but that's something that I think we could move to the next, um, but really want to take your direction as well. So any feedback on that, Val, or anyone else within the group? I think if we move it to the next meeting, it would be fine. Okay, good. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so Valerie um, is, Val is in her uh, place of chair and did, uh, Valeria, did you wanna make a nomination? What were you? Yes, yes, I'd be happy to, thank you. Um, so as you know, we would like um, the role of a chair and a vice chair in this process is really critical to um, making sure that we're successful in creating the tribal early learning hub. So by electing a tribal representative um, within that leadership role, I'm hoping that it'll help to ensure that ELD, um, there's some accountability on the state side for this process and that ultimately we're enabling you know, our tribes to be really the driving force of this work. So I'd like to nominate uh, Valerie Switzler to this role today. She's been an instrumental um, person in the continuous advocacy for the Tribal Early Learning Hub in Oregon since um, really the first hubs were started. And she shared that she is committed to taking on this role if others feel comfortable with that and want to vote um, her into this role. So if I could ask the Tribal Advisory Committee today, um, if we could please vote on um, in favor of electing Valerie Switzer as the chair. Um, and we will additionally be sharing this out then at the gov to gov meeting in December, if you guys are able to do that. And then um, Lorraine, if you wanna just give folks um, their options to vote, thumbs up. <laughs> um, if you're okay with it, you could write in the chat. Um, that might be easier. Um, thumbs up. Um, if you can live with it, um, thumbs sideways. Um, and um, there's no icon for a sideways one. <laughs> but, um, and if you're uncomfortable with it, then thumbs down. <clears throat> All right, I'm trying to see the chat now. I don't see it. Okay. Thank you. Nothing coming through on the chat yet, but please feel free to do that whenever you get a chance. I saw um, thumbs up from Jennifer, who's on camera, Josh Davies. Patrick, thank you. Um, Modesta said yes. Thank you, Modesta. See if we can hear Angie Fasana, Grand Ron, yes.
Um, would anyone from Burns Paiute? like to express um, their vote, either thumbs up, thumbs sideways, or thumbs down. You can write it in words in the chat or unmute. I don't know if Vanessa's on, this is Diane. So um, I'm gonna abstain just because I'm not sure internally here we have the appropriate uh, representative to this board right now. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for that reminder. And I saw Vanessa's comment to abstain as well. Thank you. And for those TAC members that were unable or absent today, we'll get this put in an email as well. But it looks like this is going um, in, in favor of yes, Val. <laughs> I'll read it. And as you're doing that, be thinking about uh, nominations for a vice chair. And um, we will get the names and then um, we wouldn't vote on it until next time so that we have an opportunity to make sure those nominated are interested in being a vice chair. I just want to say thank you, everybody. Okay, yes, we'll be sharing out um, at the next meeting, we can, we can pick up at the vice chair and then we'll look at the charter again to add additional time, as I said, for any of you to review our charter and see if there's any changes or revisions that we, we need to make to that. So look, I'll be looking forward to hearing from each of you on that. And with that, I think our, our next item is the closing circle, if I'm not mistaken. Just a minute. So I was just going to talk briefly. Um, oh, the, the minutes, it's really amazing. I've never had this before. I mean, it's all video taped. And so uh, you can actually see um, this whole meeting um, on YouTube. And Valeria can send out the link because that makes it really easy. You just click on the link and there it is. And if you don't want to listen to everything, you can kind of push it ahead because it'll be two hours. And um, But sometimes people really like to have the paper. And if you absolutely feel like you need to have written minutes, um, of course, they're just highlights and summaries, uh, whereas uh, the video is amazing because you have everything there. So um, we had thought we can try it. If it were, if, if you feel like you do need uh, written minutes, then we can do that. Is there anybody who right now knows that they want written minutes? Uh, we were just hoping you were willing to try this um, uh, reviewing the video, but we're this is your group and whatever it is that you decide. So any comments about that? Are you okay with um, having your minutes be the video review recording? Or do you feel like you need written? Any, anybody want to unmute and share? Or you can put in the chat. And we are happy to um, provide minutes if that's something that people want and um, express their preference for. So feel free to say, you know, what you what you truly like. So if we don't hear back from you, then we're thinking that means you're okay with reviewing the video recording. And you can always give time to think about it and we can talk about it uh, when we meet next time. Uh, because we have about 10 minutes for the closing circle and we wanted to give everybody an opportunity to share. And 
You know, our elders tell us everything that's significant is round the earth, the moon, the sun, the cycle of life. And so here we are in a, a circle and that circles are healing. We're all equal in the circle so that um, everyone has a chance to uh, have their voice heard. So we thought if you would uh, just think for a minute, um, what is your thought or consideration that would help um, to ensure that Oregon has an early learning system that honors Native children and their families? So what is your thought and consideration? What would help uh, to ensure Oregon has an early learning system, right? That honors Native children and their family. Um, you can pass if you want. We can always come back to you later if you want to think about it. Um, we're starting with Angie. I hope you're okay about being the first and then Allie and then the other Allie. Um, so um, if we can start with Angie. What is your thought? Angie, Angie Blackwell is absent, but we will um, go to Ange Angela Fasana if she's okay starting us out um, in place of Allie. Okay. Um, so can you just kind of repeat what you were saying again, just about what the question is? <laughs> yeah, what is your thought of consideration? What would help to ensure Oregon has an early learning system that we're working on, right? That honors native children and their families. Like what's the one thing that stands out for you? Like, this is really important. If this is gonna work, um, what is it that we really need? What would you like to see? What's your Strong thought? curriculum that reflects the tribal nations in this state. Great, thank you, the curriculum, thank you. So who would be next, Valeria? Who would you want next? Would it be Ali next? Uh, Alyssa, I don't see Ali on the call. Oh, okay, Alyssa. Did you wanna share Alyssa? Okay, we have Alyssa Severinson and Alyssa Lane Keen. Are they both here? Um, absent. We're going to skip down, I think, to um, Diane Tiemann. And the question is, what is one thought or consideration you have that will ensure Oregon has an early learning system that honors Native children and their families. And I put it in the chat for folks. Should we go to the next person then? Sure. So would that be, oh, go ahead. This is Jennifer. I think I'm the next person. All right, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, what I really want to see is um, our uh, infant toddler and our uh, the infant and toddler mental health specialist really be mindful of how they um, the strategies and the behavior the behavior strategies they're implementing within our populations because a lot of it doesn't. Um, it goes against a lot of our teachings and our practices. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jennifer. Josh, you're next. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of just speak for my aunt as well because she had to leave a little bit ago. So um, for me, it's, it's more of a holistic approach. Um, so seeing the other end of it, working with the elementary and the middle and the high school students, the family dynamic um, tailors away from it. And I don't know if working that way at the beginning to where you have a, a nurture system where it's a holistic approach where you get that buy-in right away from the parents. And I don't know if 
if it would allow for more buy-in to continue as the grades move on. Um, but a lot of our families have had a really hard time with, with education, with the school system. And now those parents and grandparents are, are raising our little ones. And how do we, I don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to repair that damage that's been done outside of our walls and outside of our, our uh, lands. And uh, moving forward, it would be really nice if that holistic approach that starts at such an early age with our little ones would somehow develop into a continuation into the elementary, middle, and high school um, students. I know that's on the other end, but it, it would be really nice if we could get everybody in, in good spirits when they, when they start and keep them there. Absolutely. Thank you. Is Julie here? Uh, no, that's my aunt. She had to, she had to oh, read about 15 minutes ago. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, Christina? Christina's absent, so it's Lloyd. Lloyd, I know, is here. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, Long-term <laughs> commitment, not just based on the legislature. Thank you. Valeria, did you want to call on them? Because you know who's here and who's not here. Yep, happy to. Um, yeah, let me just read in the comments to Diane. Thank you for adding. Um, she said that she just wants our kids to be able to learn in a culturally appropriate way and environment and not have to deal with institutionalized racism. And then we'll go to Michael Cherry. Thank you, Valeria. I actually have something very similar to what Diane just typed in and just really thinking creatively about the ways in which we can incorporate the culturally specific ways that our kids can learn and respecting that and honoring that because, um, you know, I've had four kids in the public school systems um, and still do. And that's just something that we really need to focus on and that needs to be addressed. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll move to Modesta. I think Modesta had to leave. Oh, thank you. So Patrick, if you're still on. I, I am, and at the risk of exposing my weakness in this particular area, I would say that one of the important things from my perspective is um, agency and local buy-in because to, listening to all of you, I have every reason to believe that you will come up with a robust effort, a curriculum, um, something that will suit the needs of the tribes and, and children within the tribes. But what seems to me to be equally important is if you don't have buy-in within the academic institutions where that curriculum is implemented, then it, that curriculum has, uh, I don't want to say no value, but a great idea uh, doesn't achieve its purpose if it's never implemented. So that, that buy-in, I think, is, is incredibly important. Thank you. Um, Val. You're next. Uh, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is that I'd like to see our an ECE or early learning division is the honor and respect for our culture and our language and our life ways to be taught in a way that, uh, you know, uplifts, uplifts the child. Thank you. Vanessa? She put in the chat, culturally appropriate ways and support native language. Agreed. I heard a lot of themes coming out, um, you know, institutional systems, the racism, making sure that they're culturally appropriate and responsive to the needs of our kids. And I share that sentiment as somebody who just transitioned to the K-12 system myself with my own child. Um, we're you know, talking a lot about uh, giving thanks this month and our native way of giving thanks um, versus 
uh, what's coming up around this holiday next week. So um, that's been interesting because every day my daughter comes home talking about Thanksgiving and Turkey and <laughs> a lot of stuff <laughs> she's learning in that public school. So it's um, very much an opportunity for us to keep talking. And then that is our closing circle, I believe. And speaking of, we'll just close with um, this little quote that I found that I thought would be fitting for this month and with the, the um, holiday coming up um, that people are celebrating. And just know that we will give thanks every day, not just one day or one month out of the year, but every day. And also for the unknown blessings that are already on their way to us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. And I'm going to pause the um, recording. And if Val, do you want to close us out maybe? Sure. Good way.